good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, this week again for another uh, session of Truth Be Told with uh, Khalid Janahi. Uh, first of all, uh, Khalid, I just want to extend uh, on behalf of all of us uh, our sincere condolences. The last week we weren't able to uh, do the show because of uh, a loss in your family. So please accept our condolences and thank you for following up with us uh, uh, today. Um, so we have a, a very uh, uh, important topic uh, today. So we've played around with the, with the terms and, and used the original uh, Latin terms with neque uh, panem et circenses, which must have made uh, happy my uh, old Latin teacher at school, but I'm sure the declination is wrong, but anyway, we don't care, which in other words means no bread and no circuses in the Middle East. So basically, uh, we feel that in the Middle East, we're facing a double or what we call a triple whammy, if you will, where COVID-19 added to the oil prices that are much lower, uh, <clears throat> seems to be making us all fall in a age of austerity and a, a change in uh, how things are done, uh, whether it's in business or on a social level. And it might be uh, the same thing for the entire world. We're seeing things change. We're seeing, you know, disruptions everywhere. So today we'd like to <coughs> talk with you and discuss with you uh, this point, are we entering an age of austerity whereby many of the things that we got used to and we took for granted will have to change or are completely gone? Uh, thank you very much, Alan. Thank you very much for the condolences. And sorry about last week, but uh, it was a sudden, uh, unfortunately, demise of somebody in the family. So I could not uh, do that. Um, it actually, it is an interesting, I mean, before we talk about the Middle East, let's look up about the bigger picture. I mean, 1900 or so years ago, when the uh, Roman poet Jointal came out with this uh, term, bread and circuses, what he was aiming at is basically what he saw, the decay and the erosion of the fabric aspect of the Romans, the Roman people, in terms of their civic duties. And the way that was done is that the only interesting thing for the Romans at the time was the bread and the circuses. Of course, the circuses here means at that time, uh, basically the gladiators fighting and they were getting into free to watching that. And the, the food is basically the grain and everything else that they were getting in return for that. So the most important thing was that they were getting the food and they were getting the circuses. Whilst they were giving away all other aspects of civic duties, all other aspects in terms of the politics of it all at the time and allowing the so-called politicians, the rich politicians to take advantage of their positioning. So that was the way the phrase came at the time. And actually, when we look at current uh, days, even that, uh, if some of you have been watching uh, the Hunger Games, you know, the series, the three movies from 2008 to 2010, uh, I think it was by Susan Collins, uh, she, she wrote the thing, and it is actually, it's all about a uh, story, a fictional city called uh, Panem, okay, and where people are given basically entertainment and lots of food, but then taking away all other rights from them, or better way to put it, they give all the rights away in return for the food and the entertainment. So that was basically the context of the way it was in the past. And then we come throughout the ages uh, from then on. And we see this actually as an ongoing thing everywhere in the world. So that created some sort of a social contract between the ruler and the rules uh, across uh, the globe in one shape or the other. So every place have got their own specificities, but we've had that. And what it does is that over the years, that there has been basically erosion of our, as people, our responsibility towards others, okay? For the sake of basically food and circuses, or let's call it here, in today's uh, world, food is food uh, and free money that you get, and entertainment is consumerism, and the other side is the welfare. So it's a welfare state and consumerism, basically is what is today's uh, thing on, on the table. Uh, but both today, suddenly, we're finding ourselves, uh, even before COVID, 
there is an erosion of the cake. The cakes have been getting smaller. Uh, I mean, when the cake was growing, it was easy to give away part of the cake okay, and create entertainment on the other side uh, in terms of the consumerism and everything else. Create that and people basically uh, were happy with that. But as the cake was getting smaller and smaller, it becoming more, more and more difficult how to handle that, how to go out of this major issue of to keep the people, the spirits at bay, okay, by giving away everything, all their civic rights and return for something that they were getting. And what's happening now, there is no food and no circuses. Suddenly they, now with COVID-19, of course, it's quadrupled uh, the problem where uh, there are COVID-19 issue, so the entertainment has gone away. We don't see entertainment that much. Number two, the commodity prices, as you just said yourself, are going down everywhere, uh, not just the oil, and apart from the oil, so it's been going down. So all this, the food and entertainment was paid for from the natural resources that we had across the globe uh, in different countries. But people have lost their way now that suddenly they find themselves in a situation, okay, something has to give. So what do you give? Uh, and here is the social contract. And there was a good article just three days ago, but that's a global thing in the Financial Times by Philip Stevens about the COVID-19 and the effect on social contract going forward. And the people now, this is of course on a global basis, what are they looking for? This is the thesis in, in the writing in Financial Times three days ago, is that everybody's looking at the people in the position of leadership. They're looking towards competence and fairness to be the number two priorities, number one and two priorities in any person in a position of leadership going forward. So that and that in itself is going to be creating basically changes in social contract on a global basis. Now, when we come to the Middle East, we have a different aspect here. So we have much more of a problematic factor that over the years, it's been easy to create this element of giving the bread away okay, and giving entertainment. But now suddenly we find ourselves, okay, now something has to give. Somebody, somebody has to pay for this bread and creating the entertainment. And the only way we see it happening, the only way we see it happening is going to be through taxes, okay, and reducing basically subsidies. So subsidies are going to go away and taxes are going to come through. So that immediately creates the next problem in hand. And that problem is a major problem. And if we go back to uh, the, one of the 27 grievances that uh, the American uh, under the U.S. Declaration of Independence against uh, George III of Britain, one of them was no taxation without representation. It was one of the 27. So basically what that means is that if I pay tax, okay, I need a service in return. Uh, unlike the way it used to be where I was not paying taxes, okay, and I was basically was happy not to take a service in return. So now, it is, I am paying taxes, so I need service in return. So we're going to find ourselves that taxation is going to be the norm going forward. Now, how, how do you do, and, and to, fix, to fix this, and it's a global issue, uh, we're going to see this happening everywhere. Uh, we see, actually, it's not just starting now. We started even, if we look at the Oxfam report of th three years back, where uh, basically the gap between poor and rich is getting wider and wider and wider. Uh, the 1% owning 90% of the wealth on, on earth. I mean, that is not sustainable. So all that is a question of now how you uh, tax the rich okay, to basically make sure we have a fairer world where there is no more bread and there is no more entertainment. So how do you do that? So in that aspect, you need to change your social contracts in so many different ways to, do, to go forward with that. Had it, I, I just, you know, I just want to add something because when we talk about COVID-19, COVID-19 has also been a really catalyst for uh, digital or technological transformation. So we've moved very fast into uh, using technologies that were available, but that have, haven't been, hadn't been adopted yet. And what we're seeing is also that 
look at the, the size of tech uh, within the stock market today, they, re they represent, if you take the FANG plus Microsoft, they represent maybe 25% and they're, they're the one leading the, the, the rise in the stocks. And on the other hand, you have the mom and pop shop, the restaurants that are shutting down, closing down. And so there was a topic that was recurrent before COVID-19, which was the universal basic income. So we were talking about disruption. We were talking about this platform becoming so strong, so uh, um, controlling, so, so huge parts of the uh, business and this disruption really not like previous uh, uh, revolutions or industrial revolution, uh, creating new types of jobs, but this one uh, doing a pure destruction of jobs. So in this, in this focus, do you see, for example, uh, globally or also, or maybe faster in the Gulf, this bread becoming uh, through a universal basic income? Well, look, I mean, this universal basic income has been going on. It's not just, uh, did not happen today, did not happen uh, post COVID. It has been, we've been talking about it pre COVID for, for a long time. Mm -hmm. But coming to your point about the new economy, the new digital economy. I mean, th that in itself gives me a feel that no longer for the young, especially Generation Z and Generation Alpha, and maybe if it's going to be called Beta, the one after that, they no longer need the bread the way the bread was happening, okay? Nor actually the entertainment, because entertainment today is a global thing, okay? It's a global entertainment. So consumerism uh, through e-commerce is a global thing. In terms of basically touching base with each other, it's a global thing. So the young, the young are the ones who are going to basically force change, okay, in the social contract aspect, more than my generation, okay, or the generation before me. We are more because we are holding back. Nobody, nobody likes, nobody enjoys paying taxes. Okay, let's make it kind of, because it's all going to go around this. Nobody enjoys paying taxes. But then to really look at Generation Z and Generation Alpha and the ones after that, where they're going to take over. I, I, I always say the young, they own the table. They no longer have a seat at the table. And, they own, and whether we like it or not, the quicker we understand and accept that in my generation and the one generation before, the quicker it will be an easier life for everybody going forward, for us and for the young going forward. So this issue of bread, and I think that's why I like the subject, this issue of the bread and the circus, is no longer the case. If Juvental was here today, okay, and looking at the young and looking at the situation we're in today, he will be a happy person because he knows change is happening. He knows that the word dignity is no longer going to be taken away from you. Okay, you're going to basically force your dignity on everybody. Now, that unfortunately, that transitional period is going to be very bad. It's not going to be easy. Now, this affects different countries, different ways. I mean, today, if, if, I, if I just take, for example, where you are, just the income, just the income, annual income, uh, reportedly the annual income of Adia, okay, just like, uh, and we, everything stops in UAE, and we just take the annual income of Adia, and Adia's assets are managed as they are. There is no, I'm making an assumption, they don't go up, they don't go down, just basically the income that they make annually. That is, for the indigenous population, the UAE population, that is $40,000 a year. Now that is talking about the basic uh, sort of salary that we need, the income, that's substantially much higher than the basic that you need. That, in the, I know it's a simplified way of looking at it, but it's a good way of looking at it, just looking in depth. And country like UAE, the resources are substantial, uh, there, but the oil price is going down. Okay. Yes, you want to go into a different thing today in terms of green uh, energy, in terms of green investment, in terms of digital investment, in terms of the, what's coming up forward. But that's not what it's all about at the end of the day. It's this one million people, I'm just using as you as an example, where they're going to go with their civic duties themselves. Uh, it's not a question of being, yes, if anything comes, we take it, we are happy, it's a beautiful place. They have to have their mindset they have to basically be thinking outside the box and doing things themselves and going forward. So it's not for them, it's for the generation which is coming and afterwards. So what you have, you have, you have in, 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 in the Middle East today, in the Middle East is that what I see what's going to happen is that taxation is going to come through. But look at the world. The, the world, okay, the rich, when we look at the rich of the world, I mean, 
there, there is a lot happening for the rich in the world today. Some of them, like I think, uh, a movement started by the Disney, Iris Abigail Disney, okay, where basically it is uh, millionaires for humanity. So it's all about tax us for the sake of the humanity. But it's not just tax us uh, sort of naive in a naive way for the sake of the humanity. It has to be for the good of the humanity and taking the humanity forward rather than keeping the humanity, as Juventel said, where they are and nothing happens. So it is a question of really investing on health, really investing on education in the right manner and investing in the skills in the right manner. So this new social contract is going to be diversified social contract. There's going to be health social contract, which we need to make sure is done correctly. There is going to be an education social contract which needs to be done properly. There is the social contract between the employer and the employee. There is a social contract between m men and women. You know, it's, it's going to change and it's going to happen. So either we are part of that, okay, or we're going to be as usual behind big time, just living off what we have the resources today. So it's all about where do you focus now? So taxation for me is the way out as it is globally. Okay. I mean, this fairness, this business of competence for, from a leadership perspective that uh, basically Stevens was talking about in his, in his writing, it's all about that how you do that. So you take from the rich, okay, but you don't just give it to the poor. You create opportunities for the poor to bring them up and uh, to bring them to the next layer. Now, is that going to be done in our part of the world? I think there is no option but to be done. Now, how do you charge taxes? How do you get taxes? What I'm worried about and what I see happening is that we are solving it in a different way. We are solving it by not being fair. Okay? And fairness here, what I mean is when we tax, and I like to see this happening, and it will happen one day, okay? Uh, the rich, there are rich everywhere in the world. But how did you become rich? Okay. Now, different people become rich in a different way. There are people who basically work and they, and they make money and they invest their money in the right thing and they make money out of that. That's one type of richness. There is a richness, somebody who's an inventor, as you spoke about, I mean, the Zuckerbergs, the Gateses of this world, and so on, so on. So these guys are basically innovators. They created something, and it's big. So they made their money, their big wealth out of that, okay? Uh, so th that's another type of, of rich. Then you have rich, as I said, this Disney Iris girl who basically she is rich because her father and uncle, they made such a big thing. They were innovators, and, they, and she made money, okay? That's type of rich. Then you have other types of rich. You have rich where son or a daughter of somebody through a monopoly. Okay. You find a lot of monopolistic people who have become very rich okay, in different parts of the world, but more in the world where you don't have basically what is called the liberal, uh, liberalization per se. I don't want to call it liberal democracy. It's called liberalization per se. Okay. So you find more... Uh, monolistic sort of richness and that side of thing. So that's different type of richness. Then you have richness where you are born uh, through nepotism, you just get money. Okay, that's another type of richness. Now, the charges on somebody who is rich through the monopolistic or born, uh, not with a silver spoon, born basically saying, I have the right to the wealth. Okay, but now these people, okay, should be, should be, okay, tax differently than someone who is working and making money, okay, uh, through hard work. So, but what's happening, that's not happening. So what's happening, and that's what the call is across the globe. I mean, last year in Davos, not this year, last year, we had this, uh, I forgot his name, this Dutch uh, historian who came, actually he was fresh, uh, I mean, uh, he, he's Dutch, so he's not a, an easy person to talk to, but he, he came up, and I think with his book, which is uh, Utopia of uh, Realists, okay, and he basically bombarded Davos about taxes. Why nobody's talking about taxing the rich, uh, which, by the way, all the rich people did not like what he said. However, he was going in the right direction, and I think he basically, uh, his, his words or his video or whatever just went... Uh, all over the world because he brought that into the equation. So it's not just in our part of the world, it is 
even the global world as a whole. But I think in our part of the world, I think you need, there are two ways of doing taxation, either through representation or through basically repression. We can't afford repression, okay? Anywhere in the Middle East, we can't afford it with what's going on today and taking into consideration what you said about digitalization, about the new economy, about the young coming forward. So you can't afford it. So you can repress people from saying something, but you cannot repress people from seeing and watching and learning. You cannot do that anymore, especially for the young. So, so it cannot be through repression and it, and it cannot be through representation as it is in the globe. So it has to be in a way where it take, it's an evolution. I come back to the evolutionary aspect. So we need to be doing this on an evolutionary basis. The problem you're going to have in the, in the Middle East as a whole, and you're seeing, you're seeing part of this happening uh, in, in some countries, is that because we know that the resources are going to be going away, whether it is the Gulf, whether it is Libya, whether it is Egypt, whether it is all, all the Iran, all the countries, okay? You see that the resources are going away, the natural resources. And, and, and it's a problematic issue for the people in leadership position. How you handle that, you know, how you handle knowing no longer you can pay for the silence, no longer you can pay for somebody saying a yes sirism, because yes sirism doesn't come for free. Yes sirism you are providing somebody who is not good enough for a position for Adam and Singh, you're a position. Uh, you're providing somebody who's not good enough uh, to get an agency, he gets an agency, coming back to the monopolistic richness that we have. So you, no longer you're going to have those tools in your hand. So the cake, as I said, is getting much, much smaller. And the word trust becomes important. So how do you trust? I mean, a lot of us, we like to talk, especially in the Arab world, we, we, like to, to, we like to be very careful with what we say. With, we basically say, let's work with our back against the wall. That's the wrong way of dealing with this thing. Because you, need, you, have, a, you have a duty towards your children, grandchildren, and looking to the future. And looking at global issues. Because we are, whatever happens with the populist governments that we have in, in, the, in the world today, they will be ending sooner or later. Because re-globalization is coming. After whenever it's going to be coming, I, I, I want to jump on several points that you that you that you mentioned. The the first the first one uh, we're talking about a a when we talk about taxation and somebody raised the, the, the question. You have a lot of voices that are uh, talking about taxation because also governments in uh, the West have been. Uh, spending much more and printing much more and so there comes a time where the, this money has to uh, come, come, from, come from somewhere but the, the discussions and the focus constantly on inequality uh, brings in a, a witch hunt at the end and the classification that you started making as well it's like bringing a witch hunt on certain categories and let's face it if you even if you go to Europe or to just one second, to, to Europe or to US, how fortunes were made, how, how money was made. Well, you can go back into history and rewrite history every single decade or every two decades. But putting a, 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 a standard where people have a good level of, of living is, is something else. And where taxation, I mean, going back to, to the gentleman you mentioned, the, 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 the debate was that <clears throat> Taxation was very high in the U.S., for example, uh, at the end of World War II. So people don't have a problem with high level of taxation. I don't think anybody has a problem with high level of, of, uh, of taxation, whether it's in the U.S. Or, or Europe or whatever, depending on also the other social contribution that the company makes. Uh, in the mid-40s, you didn't have the level of social contribution on salaries, on social protection that you company has today. I don't want to mention France, but it's an example where you have a lot of uh, social contribution that are made and where taxes are as high. So when you do all this, you kind of also kill the will for entrepreneurship and the will in a time where you're having these huge platform. I mean, I see the risk. Governments maybe are, are through COVID-19 are taking another uh, stronghold, but I see the overwhelming strength of 
Amazon, of Microsoft, of Facebook, of Alphabet, of all these large corporations, these platforms that are basically owning the supply chain of entire industries, much more uh, problematic than saying introducing taxation, even in the Middle East. And, and just to, to say, is, I mean, you've had positive initiatives in that sense of engagement with their, their people, whether it's in the UAE, whether in Saudi, whether in other countries, where they've started really engaging uh, with the local population in terms of uh, long-term project, I think of space, for example, in the UAE, where, you know, there's uh, a, a dialogue that's starting to be built on how do we build for future generation. It might not be as uh, systematic or as uh, the way it's happening uh, historically in, in Europe or in the Western Hemisphere, let's say, but we see this dialogue and we see people um, the, uh, talking about it, even in, in the press, you know, I mean, the, the taxation and representation that you, you mentioned, uh, the, the famous lawyer, uh, Habib al-Mullah, mentioned it in several interviews in, in, the, in the UAE. So this debate is, is going on and people are trying to, to figure it, it out, I guess. But my main, my main question is that uh, when you have oil that is at the low level and you have platforms such as Amazon so it's a, that come in and really eat up big chunk of how business is, is, is made. How do you, how would we balance that? This is, this is how, I mean, this is the, the biggest risk because no, uh, taxation, no, look. We, we, everybody's, I mean, today there's going to be also a balance between the fees, high fees, uh, transition to pay. I prefer pay today. I mean, being based here, I prefer to pay taxes with lower fees than uh, anything else and ask any medium, small to medium sized businesses, they're going to tell you the same thing. So how do you see look, things move? Look, look, I, I see that the, you, you mix two things very, I mean, let's differentiate. Differentiate the Middle East, okay, from Europe and United States and other countries. Uh, I, cannot, I cannot compare Bill Gates, okay, uh, Microsoft and Amazon, okay, with Aramco uh, or with Etisalat or with any of these companies in, in, the, in, in the Gulf or even with Oreskam in Egypt. I just cannot compare the two with each other, okay? They are, it's very difficult to compare the two together. Now, when we look at Amazon, and, and by the way, the, is, the issue this, this Dutch guy was hammering, he was not hammering people from my part of the world and your part of the world, he was hammering actually the Europeans yeah, and yeah, the yeah. Americans. Because, because, I mean, the Amazons, the Apples, the Googles, okay, of this world and, and Microsoft, they've been tax planning to avoid taxes. So even actually these big boys, been, and tax paid by Microsoft or Apple or whatever, we're talking in billions and billions of dollars, okay? We're not talking about uh, we actually were talking about what I said about the income of Adia, for argument's sake, annual income of Adia, which is around 40 billion. Okay, if I just do a rough approximate number, okay, th th that is a basic number of taxes that the big names, one or two of the big names, are avoiding through tax planning paying. So, what he was getting at is that these guys need to pay that and not avoid it. Now, these are the ones who have worked, okay, through innovation, as you say, okay, entrepreneurs who created something. So they have to pay these taxes, okay. However, why should somebody who is born and he takes something in his pocket without doing anything, he says it's mine, okay, although it's the resources of the country, he says it's mine and he makes money out of it, why shouldn't he pay taxes, okay? What I'm saying is that we should pay taxes on both. These people should pay taxes and those people should pay them. We should not have, because of this yeserism, whether we like it or not, this is a reality we live in in the Middle East as a whole, okay? Going from Iran or from Pakistan to Morocco, yeserism is the norm, we hide behind it. And this actually brings back the juvenile issue, okay? That we are missing our civic duties. People who are in the Middle East, the elitists in the Middle East, majority of the elitists in the Middle East, unfortunately, they hide behind this yeserism. Everything is okay. Although they know everything is not okay. There are issues. And nobody would like to raise the issue. And I, by the way, I know Habib very well, Dr. Hayul Miller. And, and he's, he's done over the past three years, he's been bringing things up, talking about things. 
issues. And, and good. And I hope more and more like Habibs will be coming out across, not just UAE, across, across the Arab world. But we basically need to come out of that and start looking and saying, okay, we have a civic duty. Now, my civic duty is, as an individual, to make sure the ones who are making it, and you cannot talk about two or three decades of the people because I'm killing entrepreneurship. I'm sorry. A lot of the people who have made big money in the Middle East, they have not made it because they are, and they are not entrepreneurs that they created something. They've made it through, as I said, yes, sirism and nepotism. Those are the two that they've made it from. I mean, somebody who is a driver for somebody in the position of power suddenly gets a monopoly on something that he becomes the biggest, whether it's a contractor, because it's a chain supplier or logistics supplier. That, for me, is not, as you said, entrepreneurs who I'm, I'm trying to... I, I'm, definitely, I don't want the new entrepreneurs to be like those because that is going to put us deeper into trouble when it comes to totally losing our civic rights for the future. What we are missing out is that we believe, as people, that the future, we can carry on as we are and the future will be as beautiful as it is. And I think the proof of the pudding is the past 70 years in the Middle East, that if anybody looks at the Middle East in 70 years, it's, you went like that and you are going like this. Hey, you're not going to come back like that. Okay? Just look, you're not going to come back like that. The world itself has got a lot of problems with COVID-19. It's not going to go back like that. You speak about all this money which has been printed in the United States and Europe. Yes, be in fairness and in fairness issue, people in leadership position, to be fair to the coming generation, because who's going to pay for this? It's going to be taxes from the future generation. So you are making, to live today, for the stock market to be beautiful, to live today, we are hammering the future generations with these taxes. So that's why you need to be fair and play this tax rule in terms of bringing the level playing issue to be equal. Because the worry is, this gap, I mean, I don't want to call it inequality, the gap is getting wider and wider and wider. And I do not see it getting, reducing that. Although the vision 2030 of UN about eradicating basically poverty and everything else is there 2030, is it going to happen? To the contrary, I, I see things getting worse. Look. As, as I, I, again, I, I don't like to bring it up, but I will bring it up because it's a subject close to, to my heart, which is Lebanon. I mean, I look at the poverty line in Lebanon increasing from the estimated 50% before COVID to getting around 60 to 65% by end of the year. Now that in a country which is very dear to my heart, where I basically went to study there at the beginning in, in AUB, to see what's happening there, that hurts. But that's not going to be just in Lebanon. It's, we're going to see it across the Middle East if we are not careful how to manage this issue of we as people dealing with our civic duties. Our civic duty is not to be a serious. Our civic duty is to think of the future generations. I'm not saying be a revolutionary, for God's sake. That, that, that makes things worse. We've seen how bad that is in, in some parts of the Middle East. It does not work. So you need to be pragmatic. But everybody has to be pragmatic. We have to work together. I'm not saying for the people who have made free money in the past 30 years or 40 years okay, in the Middle East, give it all up. No, I'm saying, for God's sake, now for the sake of your grand-grandchildren, okay, give part of it up. And what you're going to get in the future, give 50, 60% of it up. So the cake is not, see, when, when you are in charge of a cake and it's expanding, Okay, you are basically the bread that you're giving away, the welfare that you're creating is that small portion and people are happy and you're creating entertainment. But when the, and you're taking the rest. But when the cake is getting smaller, you still want, as someone who's playing with that cake, you still want what you were taking before. So what's happening, you're squeezing what's happening to, to, the, to, to the rest of the population. And what happens eventually, because the cake is getting so small, it's not you nor the population will get that bread. So the bread is gone away. And what we see is before that bread totally goes away, we need to be across the Middle East. We need, and of course, the globe as, as a whole. But I, I see because Middle East is where we come from, is that we got to be fair to the future generations. And if you tell me charging VAT is being fair to future generations, I will, I, I will, I, I would argue against that. I don't think so. Uh, if you tell me taking subsidies away is a good thing. I will tell you, yes, it's a good thing, but it has to happen 
properly. Uh, I think I think it was actually uh, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia first time when he spoke about his vision 2030 with uh, the now uh, ambassador to UAE, uh, Turkey Dekhi on Al Arabiya. He said it. He said if you have three houses, okay, uh, and somebody has a house, why should you get the same subsidy for three houses as somebody gets for one house? That's correct. That's the way we should look at things. You know, we should look at people, but we have to implement that. Now, implementation is not as easy as the thought process. So we need to implement things like that. I'm using now a small example of this electricity charges and water charges and whatever, but taking subsidies away, that's, that's fine. Okay. Having VAT, I would say the poor will get poorer because of the VAT. Okay, I mean, and by, I mean, it was interesting that by, we spoke two weeks ago about the uh, uh, pension funds, and the day after we had the, the new uh, the, the changes in the law in Bahrain, where unfortunately the pensioners they will no longer get the three percent annual increment, which is basically to cover inflation. So they're not going to get that. Okay, uh, and, and I'm just going to quote and say they only going to get that when we're going to have a surplus in the fund now. Surplus, it's not going to be during my lifetime or your lifetime or some generation Z lifetime. So, so people are suddenly going to be in five years, 10 years, being a consumer based societies. What's going to cost you to buy something, okay, is going to be 30, 40 percent much more expensive because you are importing inflation from outside, inside, and that's going to create a problem for you. So, so, you, what, so because we, we're facing basically measures if we go into too heavily into taxes uh, in a period of transition and in period where you have a slowdown because you don't have tourism you have many things that have started as you mentioned this austerity will have uh, bad bad consequences and long-term consequences the the, the 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 saudi minister said that they will not go into too heavy austerity. So what would, what would be, I mean, to, because we're, we're close to 45 yeah. minutes, so what would be yeah. the, the drivers of a... Look, austerity, oh. we spoke about, we've spoken about, like austerity, I mean, just look at Europe. Because of 2008, okay, the Europeans dealt with it, okay, on the austerity measures. And that's why we saw what happened to Greece, that's why we saw what happened to Spain, Portugal, and Ireland at that time. It created a major economic problem, and we're still paying the price in Europe for the austerity measures we took in 2008. Whilst the US actually went on the growth side, and they went, and of course, it's a totally different, and as much as people talk about the US issue, US is a, it's a successful entity per se, the way they dealt with 2008. They created it, I'm talking the big banks in US, they created this, with some of the European banks, Everybody else had to pay the price, but we're, we're paying the price and we're going to carry on paying the price. So austerity measures is not the right way to go about it. It should be, I mean, and, and I can see the problem with somebody like the minister Jadan I mean, okay, what, what do I have? How can I deal with this? Either I take more out of my reserves and spend it in the stimulus, okay, and don't charge anybody anything, okay, or... I do what I did in terms of the VAT, in terms of taking subsidies away, in terms of, I mean, so it's either or, or a combination of the two. Now, unfortunately, and unfortunately, uh, in both sides, bad news, because what you're going to be looking at, I mean, Saudi is the largest economy in, in the Middle East. Okay. Uh, it's, it's ahead of all the others in the Middle East. And the problem you're going to have is that you need to create jobs to create, that's the way the growth will go and productivity. Now, are we doing that? I think by virtue of doing what we're doing, I mean, they're trying, they're trying very hard, as you said, to, they've opened up the society. So it, it is a very, it's becoming a vibrant society that way. The only thing is, do we see jobs being created in the next two to three years? Let's hope so, because that, that's gonna be very good for everybody. It's not just for Saudi, it's gonna be good for everybody. But coming back to austerity, I don't believe austerity in the Middle East is the right way to deal with this, because if you do that, the way you're doing with austerity, a lot of people will be okay, and because they've been okay for free, okay, they'll be carry on being okay, whilst the people who had to work damn hard for what they little thing they have on the table is gonna be much less on the table and they're gonna be much worse off. Now that is the thing that I don't believe 
we are frank with ourselves to bring it to the table and discuss it because we are worried because by discussing it, we're going to create issues. We want to work with our back against the wall, which is we are in the situation we're in today. In the Middle East, because majority of the elitists, they want to work with their back against the wall. But, they but don't want Khalid, to I, I kind of issues. disagree on this point because I, I, I mean, if you look at the debates that are happening in the region and that are also uh, uh, encouraged by the leadership, there's, there's a, 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 an understanding, whether it's in Saudi, the UAE, or, or other countries in the region, that the traditional model no longer works, no longer works in the Middle East, as it's not, we're seeing it not work either in Europe look, or working in... So just, I just want to ask you, just let me, no, no, let me finish. To, 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 answer, to answer your question. I, um, let me no, no, I didn't ask my question before, yet. But no, before, before we ask it, before we ask it, to answer your question. I, talk, I mean, I spoke about the millionaires, okay, for humanity, okay? I like to see that in the Middle East. I like to see that happening in the Middle East, that the big boys and the big girls, okay, it's very difficult, I, and I, I, by the way, it's always difficult when you have lots of money that you didn't work for to give anything away. It's funny, when you have worked for it, or your father worked damn hard for it, or your mother worked damn hard, and you have it, you don't have a problem to give away because you know it might come more because you're doing something. I'd like to see in the Middle East, okay, this hum Millionaires for Humanity, starting in the Middle East, happening right. And I don't mean here the zakat, and that, that zakat is part and parcel of religion. So let's not, they always say, let's not mix religion with state, let's not mix religion with the real aspect of going forward, with our civic rights, okay? So I'd like to see, to answer your question without you asking the question, let me put it in a nutshell. I'd like to see that the millionaires for humanity happening in the Middle East, happening at that big, where people say, Tax us for the good of the future. Tax us for the good of the future. Don't just tax others to, to maintain the situation. Create austerity to create a viable five, six years ahead. And, and, because that's the way we're looking at things. We are looking at, as we say, five, six years ahead. We're not looking generation ahead. We're not looking how we're going to go into the... You're right. I mean, one thing that we just... I mean, there are exceptions to all this. I mean... This business of going uh, and as an Arab, very, very proud. Okay. Uh, matter of fact, as a global citizen, I'm very proud of what happened last week about the Mars trip. I mean, that going to space, that is, I'm very, very proud. Okay. Uh, as an Arab, very proud. As a global citizen, I'm very proud. We like to see now, I, I want to be very proud Arab, that I see that my billionaires who have money, okay, the ones who've made it by working hard, and the ones who got it by doing nothing, okay? To put something on the table, properly on the table, to manage the transition period. Because as I said, the social contract is gonna change whether we want to or we don't. So from a pure perspective of being and trying to buy time not to change, and I understand that, it's, 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 we're, we're a human. As much as I'm, that, that's the situation, change is going to be upon us whether we want it or not is going to happen. So the quicker we adapt to change, the better it is. And that's why we don't have, I mean, how many, I mean, apart from going to space, okay? And, and by the way, and, and you have been very smart using the American technology and using the Americans for doing this. They've done a, this is a fantastic. Rather than paying for arms, we're paying for something at least worthwhile for the future. Okay? We're doing something which is positive. Rather than paying for arms and for anything like that, which is a waste of everybody's time or consumerism actions, which are keeping people happy. This is something which actually is a futuristic thing. It's good for the future generation. I'd like to see more of that happening. I'd like to see more of us saying, I, as an individual, okay, this is it. I'm going to, because it's wrong to increase the VAT. It's wrong to charge the poor more burden on their shoulders. It's like, it's wrong for somebody who is a pensioner in Bahrain or elsewhere not to give him, okay, annual increment. I'm not talking about somebody who's earning substantial amount of money pension. I'm talking about the base. Somebody who's a thousand dollar, one thousand two hundred dollars. If if you just keep that guy the one thousand to one thousand two hundred in today's world, and you say to him there is no more increases. Actually, what he's buy, buying for for one thousand dollar today, okay, it means he's buying around four hundred dollars in five six years down the road. So, 
that and by the you you, you are from a pure perspective of fairness, okay, there is there is no fairness there, uh, and I'm sure they're well, gonna. I'm sure, by to, the way, that's gonna change. But I, I mean, just because we're, we're gonna start running out of time, I, I just have two questions. The first one is that if you look at, uh, it's always easier to tax, whether it's in the West or ever, on income that is predictable rather than on capital gains or on uh, on wealth. So, w what are you advocating? Are you asking for a a taxation on income or for wealth tax or for what no no i'm 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 always an advocate always an advocate okay uh, in the part of the on the in the middle east again coming back to what i said is to start having an ongoing wealth tax okay wealth tax is one thing which will take us out of a lot of the problems that we have here it does not mean it's going to take us totally out, i don't think so no, no, it's going to buy us. Look at the numbers. Let, let, wealth let, tax. Do, no, 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 no. Let let me let, let me finish. I've always advocated, okay, for one to two percent, okay, tax for people for five million dollars and above of wealth. But that means everybody is a, it comes in the pot. Everybody. There are no exceptions that somebody has fifty or sixty billion does not come in the pot. Everybody comes in the pot, and all their wealth comes in the pot. Okay, whether it is land, whether it is sea, whether it is uh, boats, whether it is airplanes, everything comes in the pot and you charge the tax on that. Now that is a transitional period to, to, to safeguard you through this. But certainly, eventually, you're gonna have income taxes. But there are income taxes, like the rest of the world, there is gonna be different layers, okay? Rather than charging just a flat rate to everybody, you're gonna charge the people who are under a certain amount of money differently than see people are getting substantial money. So the marginal tax changes accordingly. So you're gonna have income taxes coming. Am I with uh, capital gains tax personally, on a personal basis? I think capital gains tax, I don't like it, okay? Uh, and, and I'll be honest, I don't think it's a good idea to do capital gains tax, but I prefer to do wealth tax and I prefer to do the income tax. But there is this period now because there is no food and there is no entertainment, no entertainment because COVID-19 is stopping this entertainment. You need, with the rich, okay, they need a head of wealth tax, a head of everything, to start actually doing, as I said, like everywhere else in the world, millionaires for humanity. And here, the humanity, I'm talking about the humanity in the Middle East. So they have to come out and put, okay, it's like their capital, it's like creating a new company, and this is their capital into that new company, which is washed out. It's going to go away from them, but it's their capital. So they are actually creating a true civic duty to the future. But there's also a, a positive point about introducing taxation in the Gulf, because if you look at uh, being labeled as, let's say, a tax haven, being labeled is going to become much more and more difficult to integrate within the global economies, and it might quite as well. I mean, we're also a center for finance. We, we have, uh, a set, we're, we're a center for goods, we're a center for finance, so it can be, and I just want to, there's yeah. an anonymous- Yeah, but no, but, 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 no, but, but let, let, me, let me answer that. Look, I mean, this, uh, it's, it's an American terminology because the Americans, they, they say no taxation without representation created the, and that's what I say, it's one of 27 grievances rather than the only grievances against the British created the, uh, the revolution. If you're gonna tax, you're gonna have some sort, as I said, you gotta have something in return, okay? So it's a representation. And here I would put with bold capital letters, okay, before representation, because I know a lot of people are gonna to respond to say, oh, we have representation. I will use actually one word before representation. I would say taxation without true representation. And the true is gonna be bold capital letters. I just want to, to add, we received a comment uh, from an anonymous entity who, who concludes by saying that contrary to belief, taxation also encourages entrepreneurship and growth. And I don't think anybody has a problem with taxation, but it's the introduction of taxation in the environment where we haven't been used to seeing taxation. And what is the compensation for introducing this? My, my final question to you, Khaled, is so do you see us moving more to a Singaporean model? Because Singapore is quite a, a hybrid hybrid model in that sense where you have taxation where you have an open society but still you have a centralized no. and, 
and, and a way of, of doing things yeah. that has Co proved correct. Good correct. As well. Look, I mean, I mean, a, a lot of the countries in the Middle East, without naming names, over the past 25, 30 years, they've been basically saying, we want to be the Singapore of this region or that region. Uh, that's fantastic. But Singapore, I, I call Singapore actually, is the most liberalized. And that's why I said once, I think, in the, if, if we look between 1960 and 2060, and we, we, we look at, and a historian at 2060 looks at which is the country which was a model. Okay, up to now, we are in 2020. I've not seen anything else happening. Maybe things will change in the next 40 years. It's the only country which is a great model. It is, as you said, centralized. Okay. And let me use a nice word here, dictatorship in a way, but liberalized. What that means is, yes, terrorism most of the time is thrown out of the window. So the people who are sitting there, so if the guy who's appointed them calls them, they don't stand up and say, yes, sir, okay, what do you want? They say, wait, listen, sir, this is wrong and you got to do it this way. I've been in rooms in, in, the, in the Middle East, okay, where people have been appointed, they've got so much ego, so much ego, that they are top of the line. And as soon as they get the call from the guy who appointed them, immediately they stand up with the phone. That for me is a zero person. Now, I don't see that in Singapore. Singapore, I see people, okay? Meritocracy is the base. I do not see, unfortunately, unfortunately, there are a lot of good people in the Middle East, but I do not see that being the norm, that people getting into position because of merit, people get into position because of two things, nepotism and yeserism. It's not majority. There are some good people, uh, so I don't want to be, but I, majority I, yeah. are getting into position. Th maybe, th maybe, th maybe, th most, maybe most of the people disagree with what I'm saying, but that is my view. No, no, but I mean, you, you, you have a uh, mixed of, of level of people in every but what, what, what is very clear, uh, I mean, being in the Middle East and seeing things is that there are some very interesting, we talked about space, but there are some, whether it's Saudi, UAE, uh, Bahrain, and other, some interesting initiatives I find where the communication with the leadership has changed and it is no longer a pyramidal one-sided, and especially when you look at tech and what is happening in VC and how uh, they're encouraging disruption and they're encouraging youth to start up and, and, and to do new businesses. I think that there, there are opportunities it is the, the the main the main point that we are facing today i, I guess as, as you mentioned it is that the slowdown or recession or whatever that we're going to go through uh, in post covid 19 and that we haven't felt yet because even working from home has disastrous impacts on on many aspects of the businesses people are happy because they spend less going to work they spend less at work but at the end, you have businesses that rely on it. So this transformation, Look. I see it, and the large tech platform, I don't want to sound like a, an anti-tech, but the large tech platform, they can wipe out all of this in a in heartbeat. Yeah, but, but, but why blame them? I mean, why blame them? No, no, for sure. are, let, let, let me give you another example. Let me give you another example. Certain countries in the Gulf, I'm just wondering why they have so many banks in those countries. Because maybe one or two banks in Saudi Arabia, okay, when they basically merge, which eventually that's what's going to happen, you're going to have only a few banks because they need to compete with the rest of the world. They will take over most of the other banks in those smaller countries. You don't need so many banks in, so, in these uh, small countries. So that is the norm. So the norm is that the stronger, okay, the ones who are going to provide a better service, they're going to take over. Coming back to, just to, to conclude on this, I think civic duty is important on all of us and the elitists are the number one. I mean, you brought Singapore and I, and I always get very upset with the Singapore example. We are Singapore and they are B Bangkok. Guess what? Bangkok has done extremely well. Singapore has done extremely well in different ways. Okay. Now, when, when, when you look at this issue of Singapore, I think, and I look at the Middle East, I would say one thing that we, before we talk about all the big pictures, a lot of good things are happening. You're right. And we should basically champion the good things, but we at the same time, we should bring up which are not things which are not happening. So the, the, big, the bottom line of all this is that the freedom of expression, okay, freedom of expression, we have, we are very good. And, and this, 
and this, okay, this thing which, which you don't see, the, the iPhone and what we're on, actually has created a, an ecosystem for us to do a lot of freedom of expression. But when you look at everything which is done, the freedom of expression that we have, and especially with the elitists in the Middle East, we are so good to say negative things about the Americans, about American presidents, about, about British or Europeans or Asians or whatever. And we're very good at that. As soon as you raise a question, okay, you say, okay, now look at the mirror, immediately they disappear. So what happens is that we are focusing, again, we are getting at what I call the diet of a Shema, okay? Look at outside, okay, without looking inside. When I'm saying look inside, okay, you can fix things. I mean, it's not unfixable, it's fixable, okay? A lot of good things are happening. Let's take advantage of the good things. But there are other things which are not happening or happening wrongly, in my view, wrongly. So let's have that discussion. Maybe in a lot of other people's mind is wrongly too. Let's have that discussion. Let's come to something where that we come back, where we implement the right thing for the future. It's always about the next generation, the current the generation Z that are living with us and the next generation alpha and the ones coming after that. That's what we're gonna look at and, and deal with. And I do not see that happening unfortunately with this business of COVID-19 has brought everything much closer to home and coming back, you are in the Gulf. It's not me, it's IMF saying the money of the Gulf, which is outside is gonna evaporate, okay? And in 2034, that was before COVID, now is brought forward to 2026. And the way things are going, because we don't know this COVID-19, is it one year or two year? And then it's a, the effect after that, it might be much earlier. So what are we gonna do after that? You know, you gotta, oh, these are the questions which uh, unfortunately I don't get an answer for. Uh, I know it's difficult, it's not easy, but if you don't discuss something which is difficult, you cannot fix it. You, know, you gotta discuss things with, and everything, and coming back to entrepreneurship, uh, Khalid, look, entrepreneurship is all about, you can discuss everything. Entrepreneur by definition is the guy who thinks outside the box, Okay, critical thinking is the base. He will ask every question. Any question which comes, he will ask. And he doesn't see that there is like a gun at his head indirectly, not seen, okay, virtual gun at his head. He cannot talk about something. He, he has to, this is the way entrepreneurs are created, by thinking totally, critically outside the box. And they are allowed to think. They are allowed to ask every question they can. It is not a question, and I, I would say, a lot of the elitists in the other world and the, and the bigger Middle East, actually they are creating a problem by not talking about issues which are there to be because for different reasons. They wanna walk their back against the wall or they want to have uh, an agency or they want to have a position somewhere. That is basically not the right way for the future. The future is more to think about these youngsters coming up, how we're gonna deal with it. So if there's one thing left out of this, Khaled, is that I call for millionaires for humanity in the Arab world. And I'd like to see them pumping every one of them, not the ones only that they worked hard and they worked very hard for their money. They are, they're always the easier ones to pay. It's the ones who got it without really working very hard for their money, to put money on the table. Khaled, uh, thank you very much. We have a last comment uh, that talks about more of the monopoly and gives an example of uh, Syria where 60%, uh, uh, if not more, of the economy is controlled by one person. And we saw the damage that they, it, uh, it, it, has, uh, it has done. But generally speaking, uh, uh, I'm, I'm still a bit more optimistic. And I see the transformation uh, happening as we speak. And I see a lot of young uh, locals, I'd say whether Emiratis or Saudis, taking uh, these initiatives and the, the type of discussions that you're mentioning are, I feel, happening, even if I, I'm not in the rooms with them, but I feel that these are happening and these exchanges are going on today. No, but and in conclusion, Khaled, by the way, I'm, let me put it this way. I am very optimistic for one reason and one reason only. It's because of the young, because of this Generation Z, because of the generation alpha these the youngsters they're going to change they're going to put us in the right direction so i think it is uh, looking for them and allowing them and rather than them taking it 
let's give it to them on a plate rather than taking it away from us. That's what I'm getting at. So my optimism is for the future. Do I see today people doing something? Yes, a lot of good happening. But is it good enough? I would say no. There is a lot and a lot and a lot which can be done. And hopefully uh, it will. And uh, once again, Khaled, thank you so much for your, for your uh, insights. I had prepared a few uh, Latin cita citations like Alea uh, Yaktaes, but I didn't have time to put them forward. But anyway, those who are about to die, salute you, Emperor. So, thank you so much. Thank you for everybody thank you for much. joining us.